we're going to get into the Word. These guys are going to stay with me because these nights have been uh, phenomenal. And if any last week was anything to go by, I mean, God moves on in Sunday nights at our church in general. But I think tonight there's an expectation. There's an expectation that you have turned up with for God to move. And I really do believe God's going to do something. He's already moving in the lives of His people here tonight. And if you happen to be new or visiting, wondering what you've turned up to, uh, you haven't turned up to a Christian club. You've turned up to a church that loves Jesus. And we just want to make space for that. And we wanna, we're passionate about Him. And tonight we are creating space for Him to just move in our life. Is anyone ready for that tonight? And so it's a bit of a partnership up here, David and Hannah and the team. And so we're in this together, Dave. So if I mess it up, you mess it up. If you mess it up, Hannah messes it up. But the great thing is Robert Ferguson's here and he can come and clean up the mess later on. And so we're, we're, we're in safe hands here uh, as well. I'm gonna pray and then we'll get straight into it. Father, again, we just come before you and I just ask that you would move again. Lord, as we come around your word, may we see Jesus. Lord, may we not hear a thought or an opinion. May we not be... Uh, entertain. May we not be, Lord, you know, distracted by what's maybe happening up here. But Lord, we want to see Jesus tonight. And I pray that we would see Him for who He is. Holy Spirit, thank You that You're here and You're speaking to people. In Jesus' name I pray and everyone said together, Amen, Amen. You can call this message, Break Your Bottle. Break Your Bottle. And... Uh, if you have a bottle, Strongy, I was telling Jason Strong over here, he was like, what are you speaking of? I said, break your bottle. He's like, I've got a bottle. If you need me to break it tonight, I, I can do that. So we're all good here, Strongy. We're all good. But a big hello as well to uh, those online and Hobart and Darwin. It's so good to have you guys here as well. Break your bottle. Okay, bit of confession session, if that's okay. Um, I'm a low-key uh, eavesdropper. You are too, don't act like you aren't. I'm one of those people, if I'm sitting across the cafe from you, uh, human nature kicks in, and I might be eating my food or having a coffee, and if your conversation is loud enough, uh, I kind of just kind of stop what I'm doing, and I just kind of like... Like, I'm one of those guys, okay? Uh, I, I'm one of those guys because I know I'm one of those people that speak too loud at the cafe table. I know people are always listening around and about you, but I'm one of those low-key, uh, you know, subtle uh, eavesdroppers, all right? So just forgive me, all right? I have sinned and I sin before you, but, you know, we're confessing stuff tonight, so this is what we do. But I um, was sitting in a few conversations recently in a cafe, and I kid you not, I mean, I, I could hear breakups happening behind me. I could hear people uh, having arguments uh, about, you know, stuff, real life stuff. But Laura and I were in a cafe the other day. This literally happened this week. And, you know, uh, there was these uh, people sitting behind us, and they were talking about how they are ticked off with the word blessed. Um, hashtag blessed apparently isn't cool anymore. And they were like, they were frustrated that people were hashtag and blessed and people were saying, stay blessed. They didn't like it. And I was like, Laura, this is awesome. Listen to this conversation. <laughs> this is amazing. And you know, I'm, I wanted everything in me wanted to get up and go, hey, see you guys later. Stay blessed, Joe. You know, like, <laughs> but I didn't, I restrained myself, you know. But I was sitting at a, conversation the other day or a cafe and I looked across the way and there was these five or six older gentlemen. And it was really cool actually and just a local cafe up here and they were talking loud enough and I find Christians are usually the loudest in the room but they were talking loud enough that I could hear from right across the way about their love for Jesus that has loved that has lasted for decades. It looked like a little Bible study group these older gentlemen veterans seasoned gentlemen Silver foxes, if you like. Is that weird? <laughs> but they were sitting there and they were talking about their love for Jesus. And I took a picture, I sent it off to my connect group and I was like, look at this, this could be us in the decades to come. But they were just talking about their love for the church, 
talking about their love for their grandchildren, how much Jesus has changed their life. And as I was thinking about that, there's a story found in Mark 14. In fact, it's found throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And it's the story of a woman, Mary, who broke her bottle or the alabaster box and she poured out perfume. And there's a, this is a conversation that I would have loved to be a fly on the wall. This is a scene that I would have loved to be in the room to just eavesdrop on what was happening in the room. I'm one of those Bible readers that love to put myself in the story. This is a scene that foreshadows Jesus' death. We are only days away from Jesus heading to, towards the cross. We are slowing down now. Jesus is reclining at the table. It's a slow walk towards the cross. Jesus is kind of transitioning and the pace of His movement is slowing down as He moves towards the crescendo of Calvary. And here we are, we find ourselves in Mark 14. And I'm gonna take it from Mark 14, verse three to nine. And I'm also gonna extract bits and pieces from John 12 because Mark and John tell the same story through their lens. And the story goes like this, while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, what a nickname that is. A woman came with an alabaster jar, very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will ha always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done also will be told in memory of her. And here we are in 2022, talking about her act of devotion, her act of extravagant worship. The story is beautiful. Like I said, I'm one of those people that love to kind of put myself in the story. In fact, this story is sandwiched between people praising Jesus, but also people about to crucify Him. One moment, they're praising Him, saying He's the Son of David, Hosanna, King of Israel. The next moment, they're calling for Barabbas. This story is sandwiched between humans at their best and humans at the wor their worst. In fact, we see this, our play in this story. We see human nature on full display. We see humans at their best. They give everything. They sacrifice something for Jesus. But then we see the critique, the mutter, the murmur of everyone around them. In fact, John tells us it was Judas that critiqued her act of extravagant devotion and worship. And let me just say this out front, is that worship isn't just a few songs we sing at the front and the back end of the service. Worship is more than just notes and melodies. It's more than just a worship leader. Worship is union and communion with God. It's understanding, God, my life is to walk with You as we learned from Duncan Corby this morning. And Lord, my life is to live in union and communion with You. Worship is about being in conversation with God. It's about living my life in a way that brings glory to Him. Do you know when you wake up tomorrow morning and you go to work, that's worship right there. The way you engage in conversations, that's worship right there. The way you uh, encourage someone and you look at someone in the eyes and you speak life into them, that's worship right there. Everything we do is worship. But here we find ourselves at this story. We're at Simon the leper's house. John tells us that it was Lazarus's house. They, maybe they lived together, but, uh, but John also tells us that people came to see Lazarus. Some of you may know the story. Jesus raised him from the dead and he was the miracle he was the talk about. The tweets had gone around about him and so everyone was headed to the house to all see the miracle that was having dinner with Jesus. Simon the leper is also sitting there. We know the disciples were there. We know Judas is there because he will later on, he'll critique the woman's act of devotion. We know Mary's there, most probably at the feet of Jesus. And we know Martha was there as well, most probably serving in the kitchen, doing what she does. 
And I can imagine that they're sitting there and it talks about how Jesus reclined at the table. Okay, go with me for a moment. Can you imagine this? They sat at the table, Mary's there, Martha, Lazarus, Simon the leper, maybe one of the lepers that Jesus had healed. We don't know, but maybe he was. I would like to think they're sitting there at the table, days away from the cross. They're chilling out and Simon the leper just kind of steals the dinner party. He says, you know, uh, it's pretty crazy that you guys are all at my house tonight. Because at one point, as a man with leprosy, I was disconnected, isolated, alone. But this guy reached out, changed my life. I used to wake up, look in the mirror and One of my ears would fall off. My skin would rot. In fact, see that bell on my shelf over there. I'd have to ring that bell before I went down any street to let everyone know that was clean, that unclean was walking through the streets. And everyone would have to hide their wives, hide their kids because someone unclean was walking through the streets. And now here we are gathered and Jesus is here. The disciples were like, whoa, Simon, that's a cool story. But bro, we saw this guy. I mean, he healed the blind. He healed the sick. Yo, there was this story, man, like he spat in the ground and he mixed the mud around and and he, like, it was crazy. You had to be there. Peter's like, yo, We saw him walk on water. Yeah, tell him the story, Peter. Peter, you were walking on water. Yeah, we were walking on water. They're probably sharing stories and the disciples are probably kind of excited about what they had seen and witnessed. And then we have Lazarus. I think he one-upped them. I think Lazarus said, your story's cool and all, but um, I was dead. I was at the pearly gates about to enter in and then I got sucked back into my body. I woke up and I could hear a faint voice in this dark place, Lazarus, come out of that tomb. I woke up, I couldn't see because there was like bandages around my face people would have been listening to Lazarus. I would like to think that they were sharing stories, being days away from the cross. And maybe Mary was so moved because we find Mary throughout the gospel time and time again at the feet of Jesus. And she probably went to the back room. She left the room. She walked to her room and she probably unlocked the safe. She probably was looking for the most valuable thing. She probably picked up shoes. She probably picked up everything that she could give to Jesus because she was so moved by what was happening. And she found the most precious thing, something that was worth a year's salary. Pure nard, found only in the Indian Himalayan mountains. She picked it up and she brought it back to the room and she began to do something shocking. Jesus was reclining. She broke the bottle. In fact, this particular oil should have been uh, mixed with other spices and oils for it was such a concentrated substance. But she, taking this extravagant act of worship, she broke the bottle, moved, and she poured it over Jesus. She began to get down on her knees and wipe his feet with her hair. You can imagine bystanders, and there would have been bystanders, for it was custom for people to come and just simply witness these sorts of dinners. And people would have been shocked by what was happening through this woman's act of worship and devotion. But what we see is in Mark 14, verse four, indignant amongst themselves, they criticise her. In fact, Mark says, he makes it more plural. He says that they all were muttering and murmuring criticizing her extravagant worship. You see, giving the most valued thing she probably had, a little oil is okay, but breaking a bottle full of precious oil, 
is too much. Here's a little side note. Your sacrifice will invite criticism. People will never understand and so they try to come up with something to make sense of why you give, to make sense of why you're generous, to make sense why you turn up to church, to make sense of why you live your life the way you live, to make sense of the convictions that you have in your life. You see, your life of sacrifice will invite criticism. I wanna say this as well, you see, your worship is not for the bystanders, it's for an audience of one. Can I challenge you, do not live your life for the applause of man. In fact, man will praise you one day and then they'll criticize you the next. And I would say, do not live by the praise of man and do not live by, die by the criticism of other people, but live your life in a way that says, my life, I will live in glory to Him. See, she broke her bottle. And here's my question for you tonight is, I just wanna make some observations throughout this scripture, is have you broken your bottle yet? Have you broken that thing that sits in the back of your mind, that sits in the back of your heart, that thing more precious to you than anything else? Have you broken your bottle for Jesus? What have you been keeping that needs to be broken? In other words, what have you placed more value in and trust in more than Jesus? What bottle needs to be broken in your life tonight? We're gonna to make space for that tonight. And we're gonna give everyone here an opportunity to bring their bottle and break it. What's the most precious thing to you? Is it a career? Is it a person? Is it a relationship? Is it material things? Maybe something someone said? Maybe something that happened in your past? Maybe that's something happening to you? Maybe it's the chaos around you, but what is that bottle that you have in your life that is taking you away from looking Jesus in the eyes? What bottle needs to be broken and poured out tonight? You see, sometimes things are broken in order for something beautiful to be poured out. You see, I find God brings beauty out of brokenness. He turns broken into beautiful. In fact, Isaiah 61 verse uh, three says this, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. You see, God takes the broken things in our life and He can turn it into beautiful. And maybe you feel like your life is breaking right now. Maybe this season has brought cracks and scars and wounds into your life. Can I just encourage you? This is an opportunity for God to pour out something beautiful in your life. And sometimes God will break things in your life in order for beauty to be poured out. For this woman needed to break her bottle in order that precious oil would be poured out. What bottle do you need to break in your life? Because here's the challenge. Instead of breaking our bottle, I find, at least with me, I don't wanna break my bottle, I wanna break everyone else's bottle. We live in a society right now where no one wants to break their own bottle. But you and I, ooh, it plays out in church all the time. We would rather break someone else's bottle. We would rather, Judas is a great example of this. He looks at her bottle, knowing that he had a bottle to break and he criticizes her act of worship, how she did something and what she should have done and how she would, sometimes we can do this subtly in church. We can sit there sometimes, I can sit there and go, not my favorite song. Uh, mm, I don't know about the tune, the melody, uh, Hannah, you know, this, and Dave didn't do this, and oh, I don't know, it's just not my vibe, you know. That preacher, oh, like he speaks too loud, he screams, he yells, he's too quiet for my vibe, and the lights, the smoke, the atmosphere, it's all a bit too much, don't you think? You know what you and I are doing? We are critiquing someone who is bringing their best, and we are breaking someone else's bottle, and instead, God wants you to break your own bottle. Look on social media long enough, and you'll see everyone breaking bottles everywhere. The problem is, it's not their own. 
They're breaking everyone else's bottle. And this is why we're creating space tonight with these, this incredible team behind me, because we're gonna give you an opportunity to break, not the person next to you's bottle, your bottle. For God turns broken things and He turns them into beautiful. The last thing I'll say is this and I'm done. The second observation I wanna make about this woman is actually really powerful. You see, she anoints a king who is going to die, essentially. And he is the true anointed one of God. Precisely, he is going to die. It's interesting because Jesus makes a comment. He says, leave her alone. She's prepared my body for burial. If you look at Mark 9, Jesus rebukes the disciples because he has been trying to let them know I'm headed towards the cross and they miss it all the time because it always is manifested in, yo, who's gonna be the two I see when you're gone? Who's gonna be the greatest? Every time Jesus was trying to reveal his mission and his cause, the disciples either rebuked him and said, yo, Jesus, that is not gonna happen. No, 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 no. You remember the story? He said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. He rebuked him. Another time he said, hey, I'm, I'm headed towards the cross. And they're like, yeah, but who's gonna be the greatest? Do you feel like sometimes we miss the point all the time when Jesus is trying to reveal himself to you and we always get caught up in other things, why don't we get caught up in who he is in our life? And I wanna encourage you right now because this is a beautiful, beautiful story. You see, I'm gonna wrap this up here. Without understanding cultural background in which this event occurred, it's easy to miss the full significance of Mary's gesture. You see, Jesus Himself clarified one aspect of this act of devotion. He clarifies that she's preparing Him for burial. Stay with me, we're gonna go somewhere. But you see, I want you to see something. We might miss something that would have been so obvious to those sitting in the room that Jesus didn't even need to mention it. You see, what took place is so powerful that by anointing Him with expensive fragrances, Mary may as well have been making a statement about who she believed Jesus was. She was making a declaration that He is the King, the Anointed One, Messiah in the Hebrew that translates as the Anointed One. And it says this, Hebrew kings were anointed with sacred oil performed with extremely expensive spices only used for consecrating objects in the temple and for anointing priests and kings. The sacred anointing oil would have been more valuable than diamonds. You see, the marvelous scent this would have left in the room would have drowned out all the scent of the food of all the people in the room. It acted like an invisible crown. You see, kings and queens, they were no known in royal processions by what they wore, the rings, their robes, but this would act as an invisible crown. It's beautiful because in the ancient Middle East, the majesty of the king wasn't just expressed in what he wore, but it was expressed through precious oils for special occasions. During royal processions, the fragrance of expensive oils would have informed the crowd that a king was passing by. You see, if you look at John 12, Jesus on the donkey, the crowd was not just greeting a man and a rabbi on a donkey, they would have smelt something and a fragrance in the air. They would have smelt there was a king passing by. And I just wonder, I just wonder that they saw a donkey and they saw a rabbi on a donkey, but I wonder if they smelt the aroma of royalty in the air and it caused them to react and respond in a way, this is the King. His name is Jesus. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the one who is and is to come. You see, they would have possibly smelled who He was. Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel. You see, the significance of Mary's action doesn't stop there. It seems likely that maybe the aroma of the perfume which Mary anointed Jesus would have lingered for days. And I thought about this for a moment. We are only days away from the crescendo of Calvary. And I thought about just in a few days, Jesus was about to be arrested by soldiers. Judas was about to betray Him. 
this is crazy because I, I've read this and I was like, I wonder if this was happening. As the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, I wonder if they were met with confusion because they smelt a king in the air. I wonder if they went to put him under arrest. You're under arrest. I wonder if the fragrance would have been so powerful that they would have been a bit like, yo, who are you arresting him? This, this guy smells like royalty. I wonder when Jesus stood before Pilate, I wonder if there was a fragrance in the air, an aroma of royalty, an aroma of a king, an aroma of the Messiah. When they were chanting, give us Barabbas, I wonder the aroma of a king would have filled the air. I just wonder when he was at the post being whipped, murdered, mocked, beaten. I just wonder would the soldiers, would they have smelt something of a king? Would they have smelt the Messiah? Would there have been an aroma as they beat his body, as they dug crown of thorns into his skull? I wonder if they knew. Hold on, what are we doing? There's something going on here. I wonder if they started to nail his hands, his feet into the tree. I wonder if it was met with confusion. You see, I thought about this verse in Ephesians 5 verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, th follow God's example, therefore as dearly beloved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. You see, she exemplifies something pretty powerful. Will our lives leave an aroma in the places we go and the paths we walk? Do we leave an aroma that people go, smells like they've been with the Messiah? In our conversations, in the way we walk, in the way we talk, in the way we present ourselves, do we give an aroma you see, I'll finish here and it says this, uh, the Apostle Paul, he says, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession, procession and uses, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Hannah, David, I want you to get ready to lead us. Worship, if we can learn anything from this story, Worship is a breaking of what I have and the beauty of gazing into Him. Worship is a declaration of the King of Kings that leaves a sweet aroma in the places I walk and in the places I meet and in the people I interact with. You see, I wanna encourage you tonight as we give these guys a moment to just worship. Would you break your bottle tonight? What is that bottle sitting in the back of your mind, sitting in the back of your heart that needs to be broken tonight? This is your moment to break the bottle in your life for it is out of the brokenness that God can pour out something beautiful. If that's you, I'm gonna do something bold and courageous here. If that's you and you know you've got bottles to break in your life, would you be willing to stand to your feet right now as I hand it over to the team? Uh, it might be one of you, it might be a lot of you, but you know you have bottles to break. Don't worry because all of us are gonna have an opportunity to break your, break, no, I was about to say break your leg, break your bottle. Do not break your leg. But every single one of us have a bottle to break. And it's easy right now to look at someone standing up and go, ooh, I wonder what bottle they have to break in their life. But what about you? Do you have a bottle that needs to be broken in order that something be beautiful to be poured out? So God, as I hand it back to the team, Lord, we create a space, Lord, for you to break bottles. God, we bring our bottles before you. Lord, we want to anoint you. Jesus, Lord, we wanna wipe Lord Jesus' feet. Lord, as this woman did with her hair, she brought her self-respect. Lord, she brought her worthiness and she laid it at His feet. God, we say right now, You are worthy of it all and we bring whatever it is that keeps us from You. And we ask in Jesus' Name that You would begin to heal. Lord, You would begin to mend. Lord, out of our brokenness, You would begin to pour out Beauty, so beauty be poured out. Beautiful things be poured out. Lord, with people with broken chapters right now, Lord, we believe for beauty to be poured out. We believe for people with broken lives, 
beauty to be poured out. Lord, broken hearts, beauty to be poured out. Thank you, God. We bring our bottles right now and we break them in Jesus' name. Come on, church, stand with us. You worship how you want to worship. If you want to be on your knees, you go for it. If you want to face flat on the floor, you go for it. If you want to scream and yell and bring expression to who this Father is, don't worry about someone else's bottle. You bring your bottle and you smash it and you break it before Him in Jesus' Name.